Chapter 10. I set fire to a guinea pig. As I stood on the pier watching Malamar do crazy puppy runs up and down the beach, chasing the birds with her great faith, I saw three seals swimming across the horizon. When seals swim together, they go in single file, their dark bodies sewing a seam through the waves. All you can see from shore are their backs in a row, like one long humpbacked creature. The Loch Ness Monster and all those other sea monsters were probably nothing more than seals. There's nothing spectacular about it, and yet it always makes me catch my breath. One summer, when our family was in our skiff going up the Johnst Johnston Strait, we saw a pod of orcas coming. My father explained that killer whales live in little families. He, like most of the fishermen in these straits, knew most of the pods and could recognize individual whales by their unique markings. My dad had read all about these pods because they were his neighbors during the long days he spent at sea. This pod, he said, had recently had a 70-year-old grandmother die and a new calf born. There were five of them swimming together perfectly in sync, in and out of the waves so harmoniously and peacefully that I felt like an outsider in these familiar waters. All morning, we followed the whales up the strait, lost to time. Sometimes the whales would disappear for 10 minutes or so and then resurface someplace else to begin their rhythmic gliding. We'd gasp on each occasion and shout, There they are! There they are! As if seeing them for the first time. After a bit, the whales moved in close to shore and swam for a long while along it. They're sleeping now, said my dad. It amazed me that they could keep moving like this even when they were sound asleep. It was as if they had been wound up at the beginning of time and then let go into eternity. I was remembering this staring at the seals and thinking of all things wound at the beginning of time when I became suddenly aware that I was the only person in the world at this moment watching these seals. I walked to the end of the pier to get a closer look when suddenly I heard someone shout, For heaven's sake, Primrose, what are you doing standing out there in the rain? I turned around and saw that Miss Honeycutt had pulled out into the parking lot of the Anglican church across the street and was unloading boxes from her car. A feathery rain had begun to fall while I was on the dock, but I had been too distracted to mind. Then I noticed that the parking lot was strewn with boxes and little old ladies in orthopedic shoes, including Miss Perfidy, who went to the same church as Miss Honeycutt. They were probably getting ready for a rummage sale. The Anglican church was always having rummage sales, but for a second, I had a vision of the tide leaving the shore littered with old ladies the way it washes up kelp. As I stood gawking, Miss Perfidy stare started talking in a loud voice about how I had always been a strange, lone child. Her mother was the same. She used to count telephone poles, and her mother's mother before her, she used to sit in corners weaving indigo pot holders. A little cluster of old ladies had gathered around her as she moved across the beach. She was much more interesting now that she had all those false memories. I was looking at the seals, I protested, pointing. Miss Honeycutt and Miss Perfidy advanced on me separately, and the old ladies returned to their boxes. It's just as I said, poor supervision, said Miss Honeycutt. Stranger and stranger, said Miss Perfidy. Not enough sense to come in out of the rain. Miss Perfidy and Miss Honeycutt reached me on the end of the pier. There were two lines of seals now moving through the water in parallel rows as if they'd choreographed it. Look, I said, pointing again. Rather a good assortment of donations, said Miss Honeycutt to Miss Perfidy politely. Haven't unpacked them yet. Never know until you unpack them. People use the opportunity to get rid of junk, if you ask me, said Miss Perfidy. Both of them had turned their backs on the seals. Yes, but you know what they say. One man's junk is another man's treasure. I remember a jumble sale we had once in Yorkshire Dale, began Miss Honeycutt. I continued watching the seals. I wondered if Miss Honeycutt ever looked out the window as she played bridge all the way across China. I said, I'm giving Miss Perfidy a lift home, and I will drop you off while I'm at it, said Miss Honeycutt. Oh, all right. Thanks, I said. I had to call Malamer while Miss Honeycutt took her boxes into the church. 
Then she and Miss Perfidy got in the front of the car, and I got in the back with Malamar, who lay on top of some newspapers. Miss Honeycutt had put down for her. She smelled like wet dogs do, which made Miss Perfidy sniff all the way to Uncle Jack's. When we got there, the boys were still playing hockey, and Miss Perfidy said she thought it was highly inappropriate to leave me with a house full of boys. Malamar started barking loudly at Herman, and Miss Honeycutt looked a bit wild-eyed. I could tell she was getting tired of all of us. I solved the problem by saying I was taking Herman over to see Miss Bowser. Miss Honeycutt insisted on dropping us there before taking Miss Perfidy home. As we pulled up in front of the girl on the red swing, I asked Miss Perfidy whether she had found my sweaters yet. She said no, so sharply that in order to change the subject, I asked if she had remembered anything yet that she had ever known, just known for no reason. She looked back at me and said, let me assure you, Primrose, that it may not be fashionable, but I always know what I know for a reason, and I always know the reason that I know what I know. And that is how I keep an orderly life. One of the reasons that I liked Miss Bowser is that when she opened the alley door to the girl on the red swing and saw me standing with Miss Honeycutt and a guinea pig, she simply raised one eyebrow, took me by the forearm, and yanked me in, cutting Miss Honeycutt off mid no proper supervision explanation, and saving us all a lot of nonsense. I'll take it from here, Miss Bowser said to her, smiling with her Irish eyes in a way that was probably very insincere but very effective. Miss Bowser eyed Herman narrowly and fed him a piece of carrot. Isn't he cute? You have to give you have to get him out of here. Health regulations. Where can I put him? I asked. I couldn't leave him in the restaurant because there were people eating in there and I didn't want to stick him in the alley where anyone could come by and swipe him. The same thought seemed to occur to Miss Bowser, but she was very busy getting a couple of early dinner orders done, so she just gestured for me to put him on a stool, which I did. After all, what harm, had, what harm could he do? He was in a cage. I watched Miss Bowser bustle around the kitchen, not exactly poetry in motion, dropping a lot of stuff and throwing things about. There was flour and butter everywhere, and yet she got those dishes cooked and out the door on their waffles before you could say Jack Robinson. She had to deliver them to the tables because she didn't have any waitresses until later at night when things got busier. Then she came in and wiped her forehead, apparently having forgotten Herman. To make sure she did, I covered his cage with an old stained apron and moved the stool closer to the oven and out of her path. Then, she told me she was going to teach me how to make tuna noodle casserole, recipe to follow. She started gathering ingredients and turning waffle irons at the same time. That's just as easy as can be, I said, in wonder, looking at the simple ingredients. I'm going to make this for me and Uncle Jack. I wouldn't do that, said Miss Bowser. Isn't he the big gourmet? You know, he came in here and wanted me to change my menu. Crispy, fresh, wild greens in a light dressing of walnut oil and tarragon vinegar. I know his sort. Oh no, I said. We eat mostly pot pies and turkey TV dinners. You don't say, said Miss Bowser, and I could see she was mentally filing this under gen general ammunition, so I decided not to say anything else about Uncle Jack. I liked both of them so much I couldn't imagine why they didn't like each other. As we stirred things into the casserole, I kept sniffing and finally said, Something smells funny. Is that the tuna? Nah, tuna smells like tuna. What are you talking about? Miss Bowser said. She was very busy between giving me instructions and keeping her eyes on the waffles. Well, are the waffles burning or something? I asked. Hey, I haven't burned a waffle in 20 years, said Miss Bowser and kept flipping them out and pouring fresh batter in. Okay. Chips up in the cabinet, over the... Something does smell odd. Are the burners off? Oh my god! I followed her eyes, and we both raced across the kitchen. Herman was on fire. Well, he didn't burn to a cinder or anything, because although one of the apron strings had caught fire and ignited the wood chips in his cage, we got him out before anything worse than a light singeing on his fur had occurred. Still, it was bad enough. I thought it best to leave then because I didn't want Miss Bowser to get in trouble over having a guinea pig in her restaurant. I told her I would tell no one, and she left everything to the waiter who had just arrived and drove us home.
Okay, today we're going to add a little lesson here at the end of our reading. So, uh, I want to talk about ellipses. This is what an ellipses is, the three dots. Ellipses is a punctuation mark consisting of three dots. Use an ellipses when omitting a word, phrase, line, paragraph, or more from a quoted passage. Ellipses save space or remove material that is less relevant. They are useful in getting right to the point without delay or distraction. So a full quotation might say, today, after hours of careful thought, we vetoed the bill. Or with ellipses, you could say, today, dot, 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 we vetoed the bill. So it's a way of shortening and taking out information that isn't important. So our example from the book on page 91 was, yes, but you know what they say, one man's junk is another man's treasure. I remember a jumble sale we had once in a Yorkshire Dale, dot, 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 began Miss Honeycutt. This is from page 91. So my question for you is, why did the author choose to use an ellipsis? Have a great day.